Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Hard Sell. I'm your host, Joel Stevenson. And this week, we've got another great guest. David Spitz is the founder and CEO of Bench Sites. And prior to doing that, uh, David was a, a career banker. I don't know if I should call you a reformed banker or not, but uh, David uh, led the SaaS practice at uh, Pacific Crest for a number of years, which is now uh, Key Bank. Uh, capital markets and it's sort of been in an unbelievable um, number of deals: uh, Twilio, HubSpot, Workday, UiPath. The, the list goes on. I'm just going to cut it short for um, for time purposes. And also, while while David was uh, doing uh, the banker thing, he started the Pacific Crest SaaS survey, which I myself was a consumer of um, for for many years and, and read avidly. Um, and so it, it, it's great to have you on the show, David, and maybe you could just tell, little, tell us a little bit more about bench sites and, and the survey and kind of how all that came to be. Sure. No, thanks for having me, Joel. It, it was fun to cover you as a banker, and it's even more fun to be on your podcast. Um, it's going to be hard to get all this in, but I, I think it is worth going through a little bit of the history uh, because it's relevant to the whole sales discussion. So I came to investment banking over 30 years ago. I hate to admit that because it, it ages me uh, just to say it, but um, I was not a born salesperson. Like I didn't have selling skills. It just, you, you know, people, when you meet them earlier in the career, if they have sales DNA, I didn't have it, honestly. And it's a it's one of those dirty little secrets of investment banking. You're once you become a more senior banker, you're you're almost like a used car salesman, um, and you're you're marketing you know a brand often, and and you're marketing you know whatever your smarts and your your overall team. And I struggled honestly in the middle of my career. And if you're going to be successful in that context, you've got to find uh, your thing. And the thing that I found that helped me sell and helped me really succeed uh, was benchmarking. And, and you talked about the SAS survey and just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll cut to the chase, but I, you know, I was in, as you said, and I enjoyed that part of your uh, introduction. Thank you for that. I was in a lot of deals. The first SAS deal I did was salesforce.com. So uh, I was in the midst of that company. and we didn't even, you know, we didn't even know. I don't think the term, well, the term churn exists, but we certainly didn't have any comps to, explore it with and and you know from there over the next five to eight years there was a lot of sort of anecdotal like well churn should be you know 10 percent, or it should be and how do you define it and all these things and i uh kind of stumbled onto the idea of well rather than bsing what i think these metrics should be and there's a whole host of them uh why not ask the community and so we started this thing in 2010 on a lark and it ended up growing each year considerably. We got a whole lot better at it and it became avid reading for a lot of folks. And why is this relevant to sales? Well, what would happen if you're a banker, your sales cycle is like five years. And for the first four and a half years, you don't have that much to talk about and nothing to do in, uh, for them that you'll get paid for. So you're just looking for ways to get in front of people and get give them good information. And it turns out that doing this did wonders for me. So I would, I would go into meetings and rather than have to go and show my league tables, which is what a banker, a good banker knows they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. They would just put the book aside and pull out my SAS survey and say, let's talk about this because this is what's important to me. And so um, for me, just as a banker, again, like this was amazing top of funnel and middle of funnel resource for me. And so the aha that I had um, over the last few years and ultimately leaving the profession uh, about a year and a half ago was I think I can generalize some of the learnings. I think that this is a universal thing that uh, in any industry, there are fundamental questions that you're, the people you're marketing to uh, need to or want to answer, like, how are we doing? What should we track? What metrics should we track? How are we doing? Are we, how are we doing relative to our, our peers, ideally relative to our competitors? And what can we do? Uh, what kinds of decisions can we make to do better? That's what benchmarking is. If you have data, rather than some anecdotal case study, you have something that's really valuable to attract your customers, to have discussions with your customers. It can be an amazing 
um, customer success discussion with your existing customers. And if you're doing it well, it can be super valuable to your practice. And so my thinking was, I, you know, as, as great as it was also uh, in creating that SaaS survey, it was a really annoying process. It was annoying for us. We had something like 500 participants each year. And when we hit, uh, okay, let's close the survey and, and get the results. It took, uh, you know, sitting in a conference room for days, plastering Excel sheets on the wall to figure out like, what is this all telling us? Um, so it took us a while. Um, and that was a, you know, very sort of traditionally brutal manual process on the one hand. And then when you look at the data contributors on the other hand, the people who took our surveys, who, who basically responded to what their churn was, a lot of people were like, I'm not answering this. This is like a really long survey. It's going to take me a while. And I have to wait months to get the results. We still got many people to take it uh, and to give us the data, but it was not a great response. Um, I mean, it was not as, nearly as good as it could have been. And so that was the learnings and that was sort of the, the idea, like, I think I can make this better and apply it to lots of things. So I'm not redoing the SAS survey. The thing I started with, and which is why I'm on the show, I think, is SAS sales. Uh, and we can, we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, but that's really, I think of that as our first instance. Like, we're going to provide really good benchmarks for the sales activity for software companies. But ultimately, we've built a platform that can be deployed anywhere for any company to help with their pipeline generation and their customer success operations. So that's a, a lot there, but hopefully that's clear. Yeah, well, one thing to point out is you're really on the show for your wit and good looks, but we'll, we'll also talk about the, <laughs> the sales stuff as well. Uh, yeah, that's true. As, as somebody that's filled out these surveys, everybody does sort of their own bespoke one, and it's, you know... It, Google Sheets or Forms or, you know, some web thing. And it's and then all the stuff that I inputted the year before that should be the same. I got to go redo all that. So like there, there's definitely some uh, some real frictions um, in, in the process here. But also, you know, there, you know, as you say, like you, you talk about, you know, something like customer success and, how, you know, we, we see this and we, we think about this a lot. It's like how many customer success people show up to the customer with saying like, oh, well, you, you know, when's your renewal or, like, hey, like you guys are using the software. It's where it's like, wouldn't it be better to arm those folks with a thing that says, hey, like I've looked at you versus your competitors. And like, here are some areas where like, you're probably missing the mark and here's a plan to try to help you guys do totally. better. Totally, yeah. yeah. And if you're selling software into an industry, chances are you have a ton of that information. Uh, and it, it, it is not uh, an arduous process to mine that information and make it anonymous, anonymous, confidential, you know, aggregate the data, but provide that back in a way where they'll get answers to things they're really scratching their heads about. And you have those answers typically in your operation. And so we're focused on the analytic side of that, but also making that sort of an interactive experience and a really rewarding experience for whoever the consumer is, whether it's an existing customer or a new customer. Yeah, yeah. And well, let's talk a little bit more about the the sales side where you've started. Maybe just say a little bit about, uh, you know, what what made sales an interesting place to start, and then some of the some of the things that you're hoping to, you know, uh, illuminate for folks or, or help them understand. What yeah, no, thanks for that. Like you, you keep giving me these softballs, Joe, and I, I appreciate it. Um, so. I, for 12 years or whatever it was, we did the SAS survey. My former colleagues are still doing it. It's a great report. There are others who do it now. Uh, there's a group called RevOps Squared does a nice job for the SAS survey. These are just classic SAS metrics. OpenView does a nice job. Um, so there's there's already a lot there. And I wasn't going to step on my, my colleagues, my former colleagues' toes on that stuff anyway. But for me, I just felt like, sales was an area where you don't just collect the metrics as in like, huh, I wonder what my churn is and what other people's churn is. You're actually collecting um, performance metrics, like what did we book relative to like maybe our quota uh, capacity or something like that. So what did we book your, your, your performance, but you're also collecting information on the decisions that you're making as a sales leader. Like how should I set quotas? Should I use accelerators? 
How about decelerators? Are those, are those too punitive or do they work? And, um, you know, in terms of setting quota and OTE, obviously there's the classic quota to OTE ratio. There's a bunch of key decisions that you make relative typically to compensation plans, but also how you staff, how many AEs you have, uh, you know, what the ratio of managers and SEs and XDRs, whether the BDRs or SDRs, all those things are really important. That data exists. And yet there's not a lot out there as, it, at, you know, as there is for sort of CFOs consuming, like, I wonder what our churn should be. Mm. There's not a lot out there for the head of RevOps to, to figure these things out. Uh, now, if you're a really big company, there's some large consulting firms you can hire. And, you know, I think the starting price is probably a few hundred K and they're going to come in and they're very good in certain facets of it, but they're going to give you information ultimately that's based on their knowledge and experience, some data, but typically they don't have nearly as much data as they should either. And so my rationale for doing this was this is ripe. It's a, it's a market in terms of the end market software that I know well. So it's many of the same people. And yet there's not a lot of information out there. And the fundamental premise uh, of what I'm doing is that on the one hand, um, you're probably a little reticent to share all of your information unless you feel really safe about it, safe that it's protected, um, that you, no one's going to see like, here's what I did in sales. And so we've put a lot of thought into making sure everybody has a code name. And in fact, even under your anonymized identity, no one's going to see your individual results. It's always aggregated, it's sort of a fundamental rule that we follow. And if you can get comfortable with that, uh, you would gladly give to get. In other words, you would gladly share your information safely as long as you had an opportunity to kind of look and get some results, get, some, get a reading on the broader universe. So it's a flywheel. It needs to get started. We have gotten it started, but we're still in the early, early innings of getting it started. And the idea, just to complete the thought, and this is what we've been working on. So we released it at the end of last year in its early form, not fully complete. Um, why do I say it wasn't fully complete? Well, we didn't have instant views of the benchmarks, which was our objective from the beginning. And, and what do I mean by that? I don't want my message to be, give us your data and we'll give you something back in a few months and we'll give you a general report. That's what we did before. That works, but it has limited appeal relative to what we are promising and we are going to be delivering. And by the time this airs, it'll be out, which is give us your information safely. We're going to give you benchmarks immediately based on the data set that we have. Once we reach critical mass, that'll be a reasonable data set. And so we're going to be able to slice and dice the data. We're going to be able to show you your data and where you rank specifically as soon as you give us the information. Um, and so that's pretty interesting. There's nothing like that. It's totally free at this point. Over time, database gets super large. Um, we'll look at premium offerings, but we realize that there's huge value in having this data. And so we'll have ways to monetize it over time. But initially, for somebody who's a contributor, who's willing to provide their data, they're going to get access to this database in a pretty meaningful way in real time. Uh, so making these operation, these metrics operational right away. And what are uh, what what are some of the ones that you think are are the most interesting, or that you know you're as as the data starts to come in, you're finding like, oh, I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought that, or yeah, uh, that's that's a yeah. bit of a so, head scratcher. You know, yeah, no, th those are the questions, right? And you know, the 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 danger or the risk of doing this is in the beginning, not everything's going to line up perfectly. The beauty of doing reports and waiting and and kind of as I mentioned, sitting in that conference room and. Uh, taping stuff on the wall, you're going to pick all the stuff that really resonates. And maybe you'll find some things that don't make sense and you'll point that out, but mainly you, you're going to tell a story. That is still worth doing, by the way. But this is more than that. This is, as it grows, you see things. And in the beginning, some of those things will make a lot more sense than others. Some of those things will be surprising. It starts with very simple things. Um, so I go back to uh, the choices that you make. So if you're in sales and presumably most of the people here are in sales leadership or rev ops leadership and trying to figure out how they pay salespeople, 
one of the critical things that you look at is, all right, how do I set my quota? Um, how do I set my OTE, my on-target earnings? And, uh, and then the ratio, right? Everybody talks about that ratio of quota to OTE. What do I mean? So if you, for example, if you, if you pay somebody, um, uh, let's say you pay them 200K for meeting quota of a million two. So what's that? That's six X quota to OTE. Um, a lot of times I want to get too far in the weeds here, but a lot of times people will talk about those ratios you know, 6X is a little bit on the higher side. Um, a lot of people will look at paying 4X. So, you know, that same situation, a million two in quota, you're going to pay them 300K instead of 200K. Mm -hmm. What's better? Um, or what's more often selected? Like, let's start with that. Forget about what's better. Like, are there a lot of people uh, doing 6X uh, versus 4X or 5X? Well, the answer is that um, in the data that we have, just to give you kind of a, a slice of it, um, 6X turns out to be not nearly as popular as 4 and 5X. Mm -hmm. um, they're just a lot fewer people. In fact, there are more in our data set. And we have, we've had about 300 respondents. I would say about 120 have given us data that is substantial enough that we can use it. Those other 200 or whatever, 175 are uh, we're working to get more data from them and we'll see, but we're very focused on making sure we're, we're looking at data that makes sense. So mm -hmm. data sets about 120 and it turns out there are more people in that data set who have gone above six X. So we're really making a statement. And these, these are probably people. And in fact, they are selling higher price products. So it's mm -hmm. not like you're paying them a little, you're just giving them higher quotas. It's a higher yeah. price product. Um, but there are more people there than there are at six X. So that in and of itself, kind of an interesting data point that you probably didn't know. Um, and then the next question, if you're an operator is, well, but maybe 6X works better. Does it? Like does 6X, do people who are, you know, at the 6X level more inclined or is, is there a correlation between paying 6X, uh, having people perform better versus 4X? And the answer is no. Like generally, uh, if you pay people more, the correlation has tended to be, at least in the data that we have, uh, with people performing better. So 4X and below 4X has tended to perform better in the data that we have so far. Okay, so that's kind of a starting point. And by the way, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, there's about 20 questions that you can immediately ask. Like, all right, I get the quota to OTE, but maybe like paying more in variable comp is more interesting. So maybe we should really lean into that and maybe less focused on the quota to OTE. Um, again, you start with like what's most popular just to see where you are, see how if you're off market or on market. Um, a lot of people, actually close to 50% of the 120 or so that have given us data are paying exactly or very close to 50% exactly, which mm. is super interesting. I mean, it's an easy place to start. If you're if you're going to pay, let's say, 200k of OTE, a lot of people will do 100 and 100. In fact, we yeah. saw a lot of that in our data. Yeah. Um, but again, really interesting. Also, not surprising when we then correlate it or look at the correlation between how people are paying um, on variable comp and how their reps are performing. Again, we see that people who have more leaned into the variable comp like are at 50% or even above 50%. And there the correlation is actually even more significant where you see people who are paying more variable comp uh, have their AEs performing you know, a good chunk better. And that's in our data. So that's kind of the starting point. I could go on, but let me pause for a second because that, that was a lot of data pretty far in the weeds, but it's hard not to be in the weeds here. Yeah, it's, it's it, yeah, and all these things are, you know, sort of, they all kind of interplay in some sense and, you know, how you go to market and how big your sit, you know, how, like how many deals can a, a rep take at one point and how fast are your selling cycles. And um, it, it, it's interesting. And then, you know, you get into some of the, I think a lot of people think about the psychology of how some of this stuff works, particularly as it relates to like accelerators and decelerators. So, okay, fine. Like on plan, you're, you know, you're, you're a 200 OT, but actually if you do really well, then all of a sudden you flip the script and, you know, there's totally. certain people that believe yeah. that, well, 
you know, you should have big accelerators because you want people to really, you know, take advantage of that. And there's other people that think, well, if you actually set this thing right, the only thing that happens with accelerators is just giving away money because they would have gotten it anyway because your product market fit is so good or you've got a huge lead funnel yep. or, you know, whatever the explanation is. No, I mean, you know, those are those are, are crucial thoughts. And, you know, our, excuse me, our app cannot, the data won't give you all those answers, of course. Um, what you can, you can't derive causality from the data. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. But just knowing like the extent of like the correlation and you can try to figure out the causality separately, but there's so much ignorance in just understanding the correlation. So I'll hit the accelerators thing. So it, it, it's a really, like we collect some interesting information on it. Um, ultimately what we decided was we're gonna put things in three buckets and those buckets for accelerators. Mm -hmm. So the buckets are no accelerators. You can still pay well, but you're always gonna get 10% commission. Even if you're like two X quota, you're still a 10% commission. Uh, then there's, uh, I'll get the other extreme, aggressive accelerators, large accelerators, we call them. That's, uh, we define that, that bucket as where you have at some point as people are over quota, uh, doubling the commission rates. So if you got 10%, on target earnings. And at some point, like maybe when you get to 2X quota, like this guy's killing it, this gal's killing it, you're giving them 20% commission. So you're at mm -hmm. 2X the commission rate. There are people who do that. In fact, there are people who, who even go above that. Uh, those we call large accelerators. Again, a lot of correlation between companies that pay large accelerators and strong performance. And maybe that's obvious, but it's not like that data is not generally available, first of all, and the extent of the change, like measuring it, isn't there. And, it, you know, generally, yeah. this is the first time that I'm aware of that it's there for people to consume in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah, yeah. The other interesting thing about that is, I mean, you're, you're right, obviously, you can't generate causality from these things. I mean, I, as I would read through the SaaS surveys, a lot of times I'm trying to look at like, how far off are we from this thing? And can I explain why we're off or, you know, is it's like, wow, this like really hit me up the side of the head, like, well, we shouldn't be like that. And you go do some more digging. But, you know, I think especially as you think about churn and like, there's so many different ways that, you know, net revenue retention and gross revenue. And you've talked about, you know, we had to sort of bucket these different uh, accelerators. And, and I think that's one of the interesting things that you're bringing to this is that, there's an art to actually constructing the way the benchmarks work so that in the end, they end up being intelligible and, and you've been at this for a while. And so you've got some amount of accumulated judgment about like, this is likely to work or, or not work, which is why I'm excited to see you guys getting into the, and expanding that in, in some of these areas like sales. Yeah. So I'll just pick up on that. You, you, you said something that's really like I heard continuously, which is essentially just to decode it. Um, that that's interesting, but, you know, I need to look at it in this way because I'm a little bit different, like I'm higher growth or um, I, you know, we have more kind of elite targets and so on. So what is really critical when you get this and what virtually everybody would say to me in, if you spend any time, and this is what we've addressed with bench sites is, hey, no, we want to see this filtered. So let's say you sell a $100,000 ARR product that your ACV is $100,000. It's arguably very true that the behavior of that sale process, that sales cycle, everything about it is dramatically different from the company that sells a $5,000 a year product. I mean, they mm -hmm. might as well be in different universes. Yep. So I want to see the data with that filter on. And you couldn't possibly create all the reports that somebody would want uh, because everyone's, you know, we're going to have the $5,000 ACV company who says, mm -hmm. no, I, I, it's the other way around for me. So that's what we've built into this, um, first of all. And then second of all, a lot of people will say, well, I want to know where I am in that whole thing. So I want to see my data on top of it. And I would have a lot of people call me uh, with the old SAS survey and say, can you show me my data? And I always felt like it was a test because it was anonymous and confidential. And we didn't have any way to connect people. But what we've built into this product is, you know, you've got a code name. So if you're Sleeping Bull, on the page that shows you the benchmarks, 
there's a little box that says, show me my data. And mm -hmm. it'll show you your data relative to whatever the sliced and diced version is that you're looking at. It'll not only show you what the data is to remind you, give you an option to change it if you're like, no, no, that's not right. Um, so you can go back in and change it. But also you'll see like, oh, I'm 75th percentile. I didn't know that. Um, and that's relevant to the peer group that you selected. So all those things are kind of built in. That's that's the way we've tried to do it and addresses those points that you were making. So yeah, it, it's interesting. And I suppose the, you know, in the longer run, there's a promise here. We talked a little bit about the impact that this survey had to your own lead funnel. And, you know, I think for most companies, there's like this idea of like, well, how do I, you know, how do I increasingly stand out in this like very noisy, you know, sales and marketing and advertising uh, landscape. And, you know, the, the data is, like, is such an interesting one um, to, to do that. And so do, do you envision a world where instead of everybody trying to kind of roll their own benchmarking, you could sort of adapt your platform to then become the lead generator for XYZ? That, that is the idea, of course. Um, and another, another great softball, Joel. Uh, but I, I, um, I, I, the, I've had a number of people say like, well, why are you doing this? And I mean, this could be a really good business in and, in and of itself, the, the SaaS sales that we've been talking about, the benchmarking that we're doing there. And there's some really exciting things we're doing on that front. But in many ways, I look at that as my Trojan horse into opportunities. And what do I mean by that? Well, I think, and it's especially true for any vertical market software company, but really anybody that has kind of a unique data set that they can use and expose in an anonymous, confidential, aggregated way um, to their customers for CSM activities uh, or to their prospects. I think about it as kind of a, uh, kind of like the online retirement calculator. So we've all seen those. Mm -hmm. They're, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, you know, do you have enough saved for retirement? And you go online and, and check it out. And it's all powered by math. And, you know, presumably they get some leads from it. Um, it's the same idea where you would create one of these companies. Uh, my customers would create uh, a benchmarking app, if you will. And we've, we've figured out how to make this all work in a pretty meaningful way. And it's not just powered. In fact, it's mostly powered by the data you already have. Uh, but anybody coming in as a, as a prospect where they don't have any data, they're trying to answer like, I wonder what are, whether I should do this or that. I would love to look at data, your data, maybe you have 2000 customers where you can pull the data in, but now you're giving that prospect an opportunity to filter down to the 33 that are just like them and go figure out, ah, okay, that's what I do. And you know, meanwhile, maybe they've provided you data as well. And on the bottom of that screen, there's a get started button if it's a PLG company or it's, you know, talk to a sales rep or talk to a consultant to understand what else you should be doing. And, and they'll be, so it's like having, you know, a team of SDRs, I, I like to say, that is basically finding stuff out there. And rather than having a static report that can be very effective, of course, um, it, you know, case study, what have you, it's an interactive application that's powered by your data super powerful if you can make it work. Yeah. And probably the first step towards a pretty robust ROI model that for a lot of big ticket things are all that that's going to have to show up at some point anyway. So it's, that's great. Yeah. If you can convert, you know, it, the key will be converting those to buyers, but if you've, if you've picked the right metrics and you're giving them substantive, interesting benchmarks, I just don't see how it doesn't work. Um, and the question is like, how quickly could this be done? And it really comes down to like, well, what is your data? Uh, what, what do you have that you can expose that, you know, would be interesting. And I'm having a, a number of those conversations right now with uh, potential customers. Well, if, if you become the next big thing, uh, and you're going to do an IPO, do you just represent yourself or you hire a banker? <laughs> uh, God, no, it's, uh, no. And, um, I mean, IPOs are great, but that ain't happening on my uh, for for bench sites for lots of different reasons. So, it's exciting to be doing this on you know on the other side of things. Uh, but uh, you know, I, it, it's what's that analogy? It's it's like the I, I forget growing up like the 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 shrinks kids were the ones that were the most screwed up. So you know, <laughs> yeah. I may 
fit into that bucket in some fashion, but I'm having fun in the process. So. Yeah, that's great. Well, this is a um, super interesting conversation. We could go on for hours about sales benchmarking, I'm sure. Um, we're we're going to have to cut it short here, but uh, for folks that want to learn more about bench sites or be in touch, what's what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I mean, go to the be- the website. It's benchsites.com, uh, S-I-G-H-T-S, um, and, uh, or just email me. It's uh, dspitz, D-S-P-I-T-Z, at benchsites.com. Either one would work. Appreciate great. that. Yeah, great. Well, um, we I think we we've also done the survey um, and gotten some results. There, there's some good stuff in there, and yeah, you know, I think for anybody that's sort of wondering about where you sit, uh, I would encourage you to, to at least give it a shot because, um, as as David says, there's not much data out there, and so you, you have very little to lose here and a lot and a lot to gain. So, um, David, thanks for being on the show, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Joel.